are an independent international intelligence agency operating at the highest level of discretion. And the Kingsman agents are the new knights. You are about to embark on the most dangerous job interview in the world. Felt sorry for the boy, did you? He will find this humiliating. He's as much Kingsman material as any of them. Hi everybody, it's been a 007 here for a 10 minute spoiler free movie review of the new spy thriller spoof, not entirely sure, called Kingsman, which has been written and directed by Matthew Vaughan, who is the guy behind Kick-Ass and the new Sherlock Holmes movies. And this is a really weird little film. On one level it works as this complete love affair with the early 60s, 70s James Bond movies and the Avengers and all those kind of slightly camp but really fun spy films and TV shows of that era. It's a film that's in love with a kind of nostalgic view of the British gentleman spy who always has a martini and a perfectly cut suit, who is genuinely a gentleman, will always hold open a door for a lady, and who acts in the public good in a manner of utter discretion. And it's also in love, I think, with films that were simpler, that weren't postmodern and angsty and earnest. You know, this wants to see Batman in Technicolor. It doesn't want to see the gothic, black and white, brooding James Bond of Daniel Craig. It doesn't want to see The Dark Knight Rises. It wants to see something that's actually just fun. You know, a movie that's just entertainment. And on top of all that, this is also a movie that I guess is very concerned with modern concerns about what is it that makes a gentleman? You know, is this about Downton Abbey nostalgia and Aristos? Or is this about behaving in a certain way, comporting yourself in a certain way? And I guess it's also highly aware that creating this myth of the gentleman secret service in a period when people are very class conscious and very conscious of inequality in the 1% could be seen as kind of retrograde and regressive in a, in a really rather nasty way. So it's ladled with this incredibly politically correct sort of class hypersensitivity where the whole message of the movie seems to be that it doesn't matter if you're a kid from the estates from the wrong side of the tracks. It's not all about putting on the bespoke suit, although that, of course, matters. It's about the choices that you make and the life that you lead and having good manners. So it's kind of weird. It's a film that has its cake and wants to eat it because it wants to say that there's a kind of elite gentleman spy and that's the awesome thing to be. But it's also the movie that wants to put two fingers up at the Aristos and say, look, we can take a kid from a council estate and, you know, he'll do just as well as Roger Moore as James Bond. I think that kind of, um, not so much ambivalence, but wanting to have it all runs all the way through the movie. Because on the one hand, it's like Matthew Vaughan wants to, he misses those old um, Roger Moore movies and he just wants to make another one. He wants to make the Roger Moore movie for our generation. So he loves Bond movies and, and the classic structure of this film is in honour of that. You have the evil supervillain, you have the secret lair, you have really cool Bond gadgets, you have um, fit Bond girls and you also have, you know how Bond has those crazy sidekicks, evil henchmen that have weird sort of either physical characteristics or cool gadgets and they have um, <laughs> an evil sidekick who is this girl with um, blades for legs and one of them is like a and they both form these kind of rapier like instruments sort of a little bit like Lotte Lenya with her her shoe knife and in fact um, the Kingsmen have that shoe knife thing going on um, so it's in love with all of, all of that and it replicates it but the other thing the movie does is take the piss out of it and I heard a, an interview with Matthew Vaughan and Mark Miller, who did the graphic novel upon which the film was loosely based. So the same kind of combination that brought us kick ass. And Matthew Vaughan was really getting angry. He said, oh, it's just terrible. The BBC called this a Bond spoof and it's not. And it's really hard to take him seriously when he says that, because admittedly, for the first two thirds of this movie, he does set up the beginnings of what is actually a really convincing and engaging spy movie. But then there is a point where you enter the evil lair at the end of the film where it just goes completely over the top. It was walking a very fine line before that was sort of loving homage rather than spoof. 
But then it just goes, I mean, like balls deep into pastiche territory. Because you're running around a, a sort of an evil lair. It looks a little bit like um, parts of scenes in the Death Star in the early Star Wars, you know, when they're sort of running around trying to get to the escape ship. He is super aware of what's going on in terms of the history of cinema. There's definitely nods to Kubrick's Dr. To Strange Love all over the place. And and just the way in which Matthew Vaughan and Mark Miller construct the plot that the evil supervillain is undertaking. So what it is is that Samuel L. Jackson plays this sort of internet billionaire Steve Jobs kind of guy who has put all these uh, mobile phone chips. He's given everyone free mobile phones, which means that he can now like activate the human race to do a certain thing. There's, there's a way in which this is kind of reverse engineered by the so-called good guys that results in this thing happening that's so ludicrous like it's just so obviously over the top even for a Roger Moore Bond film that Matthew Vaughan almost like makes it cartoony he makes the special effects almost like someone's drawn them on like Roger Rabbit and I think that's when you know this movie has jumped the shark because yes it's kind of cheesy cheaply funny in a sort of sub Austin Powers way but he was actually doing something far more interesting up until that point because he'd actually created in Colin Firth's Super Spy a really admirable character. And he'd actually created in the relationship between Harry Hart, the Colin Firth character, and his young protege, Eggsy, played by Taron Egerton, a really likeable sort of father-son relationship. And the Taron Egerton character was really very engaging. You know, I wanted to see him do well. I wanted to see how he was going to respond. So I just felt it was a shame to kind of throw that away. The other thing I want to talk about in this movie is, as with all Matthew Vaughan movies, there's a little bit of controversy. So, of course, in Kick-Ass, it was all the violence and the swearing, notably uh, the strong swearing that little uh, <laughs> little hit girl was using. Um, in this movie, actually, it's quite... Um, I want to say there's not much violence in it, but there's there's an amazing action set piece at the heart of this film that's set in a church. Hilarious. And it's Colin Firth, beautifully dressed in a suit, and he's going absolutely gonzo with knives and guns. It's so beautifully choreographed. And the fact that it's egregious and over the top is absolutely part of the plot of this film. So I think that's absolutely fine. And it's it's wonderful. It's probably one of the best pieces of choreographed action that I've seen since the original Old Boy movie, which is really high praise coming from me, I think. But there's also something else going on here with the sexual politics of the film. Um, most notably, you know, there always has to be something a little bit controversial there. So there's a final scene where a, the Bond girl, so to say, offers herself to... Taron Egerton's character and you know Matthew Vaughan I think very earnestly believes that this is very postmodern because he's having the girl say the offensive thing and it just comes off as really cheap and unnecessary but actually the thing that I find more offensive in this film is the fact that once again the female characters are all basically sidekicks and rather banal and that's particularly the case of when Eggsy our sort of young hero is going through his superhero spy training camp in a British country house, obviously. Um, there is a sort of a girl called Roxy who is sort of, you know, becomes his friend in a sort of Hermione sort of helpful way. And I'm just like, really? Is this still where we are, where we're stuck with the sort of sidekick Hermione characters? You know, we've had the Hunger Games now. Can't we move a little bit beyond this? And I think it's just not helped by the fact that that particular character is very underwritten and, and the actress playing her is just unfortunately not allowed to do anything that isn't quite banal to the point where I can't even really remember the character's name or the actress's name either which is a sad lookout so overall Kingsman what can I say it was fun it's probably too long and for everything that's really annoying e.g. Samuel L. Jackson's performance which is absurd and his adoption of this sort of Mike Tyson lisp and you know, the fact that the movie just descends into crappy spoof for its last third. There's enough stuff in that first two thirds of the movie that's fun and engaging and witty and brilliantly choreographed action that it's still worth seeing. I just wish, I just wish Matthew Vaughan had had the balls to say, right, I love the old Bond movies. I'm going to make one for this generation rather than falling into, I think, what's basically quite easy, sort of poking a fun and putting two fingers up. It's just not that clever. 
But anyway, if you've seen Kingsman and agree or disagree with my take, please feel free to leave a comment on the blog at beena007.com. Kingsman The Secret Service has a running time of 129 minutes and is rated R. It's currently on release in the UK, Ireland and Sweden and pretty much goes on global release everywhere on February the 13th, including in the United States. Thank you for listening.